Good afternoon and welcome to the 154th of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today we will talk about COVID-19 and HIV AIDS with Dave Wessner. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also catch COVID Calls on Facebook Live and on Periscope. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and topics, and please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, October 22nd, 2020, there are 1,134,716 deaths from COVID-19 globally, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. There are 8,386,634 cases in the United States, up from 8,300,451 cases reported yesterday. And there are now a total of 222,766 deaths reported in the United States. That's up from 221,550 reported yesterday, yet another day with more than 1,000 deaths day to day. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic in some way, and I'd like to continue that now. Headline is Gita Ramji, a leading AIDS researcher, dies at 63. This was published April 3rd in the New York Times by Neil Genslinger. After earning a PhD at the University of Natal in Durban, South Africa in 1994, while raising two young children, Gita Ramji was exhausted. Her thesis had been on kidney diseases in children. She'd worked in a pediatrics ward at a local hospital, but she took a job on a small research project in a different field since it promised a less frantic pace. It was a life-changing choice. The research involved whether a vaginal microbicide was useful against AIDS, which was rampant in South Africa. The research put her in contact with sex workers who told chilling stories of economic hardship, high risk behavior, and men who were indifferent to using protection. It opened my eyes, Dr. Ramji told The Guardian in 2007. That's when I knew I wanted to be involved in the prevention of HIV infection in women, she said. Dr. Ramji became a leading researcher on the AIDS epidemic. Another epidemic claimed her in April, she died of COVID-19, the disease caused by the coronavirus at Durban Hospital. She had become ill shortly after returning from a visit to her sons in London. Local news account said she was 63. Dr. Ramji was chief scientific officer at the Aram Institute in Johannesburg, which battles AIDS and tuberculosis and announced her death on its website. She had previously been director of the HIV prevention unit at the South African Medical Research Council. Those jobs put her at the forefront of the effort to contain AIDS, especially in Eastern and Southern Africa, which has long had the highest rate of HIV infection in the world. Gita Parekh was born on April 8, 1956 in Kampala, Uganda, Dirarjal and Nirmala Parekh. After Idi Amin, the Ugandan dictator, forced Asians to leave that country, Dr. Ramji finished high school in India, where her family was from, and then earned a bachelor's degree at the University of Sunderland in England. There she met her future husband, Pravin Ramji, a South African of Indian descent, and they settled in South Africa in the early 1980s. After joining the Research Council in 1996, she rose through the ranks administering studies and drug trials with a particular focus on helping women avoid AIDS. Gita was fundamental and inextricably linked to the endeavors to find solutions to prevent HIV in women. Glenda Gray, president and chief executive of the council, said in a statement on the organization's website. Especially in places like Southern Africa, that effort remains urgent. Winnie Bianyama, 
executive director of UNAIDS, a global organization working on the issue, called Dr. Ramsey's death a huge loss at a time when the world needs her most. In addition to her husband, Dr. Ramji is survived by two sons, Shanil and Rashil Ramji, a brother, Atul Parekh, and three sisters, Rita Kalan, Asmita Parashar, and Reshma Parekh. Dr. Ramji recognized early on that the response to AIDS could not be simplistic and that the key was finding ways to give women control in cultures and communities that did not always encourage that. Policymakers she knew needed to understand that the ABC approach, as it was often called, abstinence, be faithful, and condoms was not enough, a point she made at the annual International AIDS Conference in 2006. I would like to believe HIV prevention will be more than ABC, she told the conference. The room burst into applause. Okay, I'd like to turn to my conversation for today. and very pleased to introduce my guest, Dr. David Wessner is a professor of biology at Davidson College, where he teaches introductory biology and courses on microbiology and HIV AIDS. He co-authored Microbiology, a textbook for undergraduate biology majors and the cartoon guide to biology. He's also a contributor to Forbes.com, writing articles on COVID-19. Prior to joining the faculty at Davidson, David conducted research on coronaviruses at the Navy Medical Center in Washington, DC. He earned his PhD in microbiology and molecular genetics from Harvard University and his BA in biology from Franklin and Marshall College. Dave Wessner, thank you so much for making time to come on COVID Calls today. Thanks for having me, Scott. I, I really appreciate it. I, thank you for, for doing this, this uh, whole series on, on COVID. I think it's really important service to, to all of us. I appreciate, appreciate your efforts. That's kind of you to say. I'd like to start out, if it's okay with you, the way I usually do, which is just to find out where you're calling from and what the pandemic situation looks like there today. Sure, I'm calling from Davidson College in Davidson, North Carolina. Uh, we're about 25 miles north of, of Charlotte. Um, I guess the answer to that question, as, as you and your listeners certainly know, you can approach with different levels of granularity. Uh, in North Carolina, the, the state has been doing okay. Um, our governor just announced the governor Roy Cooper yesterday, I think that we're going to stay in phase three for another few weeks, at least until the middle of, of November. Um, phase three is less than 30% or less than hundred people for outdoor gatherings. Uh, bars can open in outdoor areas, again, less than 30% capacity. Um, mask wearing is still mandatory. So the, the governor has been really cautious, I think in, in reopening things, which, you know, I agree with that approach. I think it's a good approach. Um, nonetheless, we're seeing cases trending in the wrong direction. I think we, we had a low point in sort of July. Number of daily cases, number of daily deaths, number of hospitalizations has been on the rise since sort of beginning of August, I guess, mid-August. Um, actually, I think in the last couple of days, we've had our the highest number of new cases per day uh, for the entire pandemic. So, so things are are trending in the wrong direction, but we haven't seen the, the huge surge that we've seen in some other places. So I think as a state, things are going okay. They certainly could be better, but they're going okay. Um, more locally at Davidson College, the students came back to campus in end of August uh, as scheduled. Faculty had the option of offering courses totally remotely, some hybrid remote face-to-face -face or face-to-face. -face. Uh, and I, I think almost all courses are remote or some hybrid combination of remote mm -hmm. and some face-to-face. -face. We've had periodic cases on campus among students since we've opened, but it's been very, very low numbers. I think the students have done a, a great job of adhering to you know, all the all the social distancing, mask wearing, et cetera, that the college has had in place. So on campus, things have gone, have gone well, I think. It's entirely residential campus there? It, it is, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, students were given the option of returning or staying home or living off campus if they so desired because of uh, various concerns. Mm. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure the actual number that are on campus in the residence halls, but it, it's certainly not full capacity you know, in the residence halls. I know at a lot of universities and uh, Drexel's the same faculty in public health and engineering 
in biology have actually been drawn into the process of advising the university and decision making. Do you find yourself in that in that situation? Were you part of the of the thought collective that had to make those plans for the fall? It, yeah, there were there were various groups that were involved in, in all sorts of things from what's calendar don't look like to what's the you know, appropriate and safety precautions. So yeah, yes, there were some discussions over the summer about you know, what are the requirements for mask wearing. Should mask wearing be mandatory indoors, optional outdoors? Um, so yeah, I, I've been involved in some of those discussions over the, the course of the last the last six months. It's a, it's a tough, it, there's no right answer to mm -hmm. what colleges should do. There's no right answer to what, what towns and States should do it. It's a tough, tough position. Your students must have a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, they, I they, mean yeah. more than usual, maybe. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that, that's true. Um, yeah, I think I mean, they have questions already about you know what's what's going to come next. What's the spring going? Sure. And we don't have answers to those questions yet. Yeah, I, mean, I think the dynamics are changing at such a rapid rate. It's really hard to predict what's going to be the best approach you know, three, four months down the line. Well, you've been very prolific in this time. We were talking before we came on about the need for good science communication in this time. I wonder if you could say just a little bit, really kind of before we get started, about your own background and, and how you got into into science and how particularly you got interested in HIV AIDS. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I was always that kid that liked, liked biology. I liked you know, playing in the stream and turning over a rock and seeing what was there and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, at college, at, at Franklin and Marshall was when I first got exposed to sort of the molecular biology side of things. I mean, this was the early 1980s recombinant DNA technology was still a, a very new thing. Um, and I got exposed to that for the first time and really was amazed by the, the you know, what could possibly be done in the biological realm with, with those new techniques. Um, and two other professors in particular at Franklin and Marshall, Carl Pike and, and Dick Fluke, really emphasized the experimental nature of biology, which you know, was something new for me. It was new for me that you know, me as an undergraduate could ask a question and actually test it in the laboratory and get an answer that potentially no one else had before that. Uh, and I think that's what really, really hooked me, that this was, you know, this was not just memorizing a set of facts, hearing about what other people did, but this was a field in which I could be, be actively engaged. I could I could drive the knowledge base forward in, in some way. Um, so I really have to credit to them for, for showing mm -hmm. that you know, being a biologist was was a thing. <laughs> you, you, you could do that. Sure. Yeah. Actually make a living. Like that. That and, and what a time to be to be doing that. I mean, you know, for so long, physics had, and chemistry had sort of dominated experimental science and then you know biology and microbiology in the 70s and 80s and and, and i think still to today but certainly in those days was really emerging on the scene um and you yeah. you kind of hit it at the right moment and uh, absolutely yeah yeah and, and then after when i graduated I went to to harvard and i was I gravitated gravitated towards infectious disease microbiology for a variety of reasons but the you know that area MIT, Harvard, the whole Boston area was really a hotbed of HIV AIDS research in the mid to late 80s and continuing to today. Um, and our lab didn't work specifically on HIV. We're using other, studying viral pathogenesis using other, other systems. Um, but just being in that milieu during that period of time was, was really exciting. It was exciting to, to just be at least tangentially part of all the stuff that was going on uh, with that very, very socially relevant issue at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So, well, let's let's turn to this discussion about HIV, AIDS, and COVID. And I think there's, uh, we'll sort of tackle it in a couple of different ways. And maybe we'll talk about um, what you know about the experience of people who are living with HIV, AIDS, and how COVID is impacting them. But then also the kinds of analogous thinking lessons we might learn from HIV AIDS um, to help us think through COVID a little bit. And so maybe we'll just start a little with um, kind of the situation as best you know it. I mean, what, what have been the impacts on the coronavirus, on COVID-19, on people who are living with HIV or with AIDS? That, you know, in the 
pandemic, the COVID pandemic first started, that was understandably a big concern in the HIV field. And what impact is this going to have on on this population, people living with with HIV? Um, and it, it's 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 been interesting. I mean, there's still not a whole lot of really good data. I mean, we're in the middle of this current situation. We don't have a lot of really good data on on anything. I don't think uh, right yet. But it's it's been interesting to see that sort of that intersection between COVID and and HIV. Now, I think initially the assumption was this is going to be bad for people with with HIV AIDS. You know, if you have HIV, you're going to be more likely to become infected with SARS-CoV-2. If you're infected with SARS-CoV-2 and you have underlying HIV disease, you're going to have a worse, a worse outcome. I mean, that's a very reasonable assumption to make going in. Uh, and the, the, the data that are out there, the studies that have been conducted so far, don't really bear that out, which, which is a good thing. Um, again, there's been you know, not a lot of great studies done, but there's been a, a couple sort of retrospective cohort studies where they've looked at, the researchers have looked at individuals who are HIV positive and become infected with SARS-CoV-2 versus the general population of people who become infected with SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them have shown you know, a slightly greater mortality rate in individuals with HIV and SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, but none of the studies that have come out so far have shown a significant increase in mortality, um, a significant increase in severe uh, outcomes associated with, with SARS-CoV-2 infection. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, you know, there's none of the studies so far have shown a conclusive um, worse outcome as a result of underlying HIV infection. Right. And, and part of the issue with that is you know, a number of the studies have been done in Europe. There's one that's done in, in Spain, there's a couple of them done in the United Kingdom. Um, in those regions, most of the individuals at this point in time who are HIV positive are also on antiretroviral therapy, uh, which means they you know, they probably don't have the underlying immunodeficiency that we think of with AIDS. Right. Because back 20 years ago, 30 years ago, if you had HIV infection, you know, chances were that the outcome was not going to be good. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of good, good drugs available. When the triple drug cocktail became available in the late 1990s, you start seeing people living with HIV rather than dying of, of AIDS, as the study goes. Um, so, you know, jumping ahead to today, looking at those individuals who are HIV positive and also get infected with SARS CoV 2, I mean, most of them are on the good drugs. They're fairly healthy despite the HIV infection. Yeah, so, so, if you're looking at that population, maybe it should not be surprising that there's not a great increase in mortality uh, and morbidity associated with the SARS-2 infection. I know factors of, of geography yeah. and, you know, all of the normal sort of factors of um, race and demography and comorbidity have to be taken into account, but just sort of generally speaking, um, in the United States or in Europe, what's the expected life course for someone with an HIV diagnosis at this point? Yeah, it's largely a, a, a fairly normal life. Um, mm -hmm. and we have people now who are, you know, have been on drugs for 30 years. There's, you know, there's side effects associated with some of the drugs. It, it's not a complete walk in the park to, to have HIV by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but we're seeing people live relatively normal lifespans, relatively healthy lives uh, with the HIV drugs that are that are out there. Um, so it, it's, I mean, it's changed dramatically uh, within the last 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and if I could just jump back to the, the obituary you read in the, in the beginning, very appropriate for for this this topic. Uh, in the issue of you know, a vaginal microbicide is remains critically important. And I think one of the one of the failures in the HIV field is that there still isn't a female centered approach to mm. HIV prevention. Uh, in too many regions of the world, you know, women can't dictate the use of condom with a sexual partner. Um, in case of sexual violence, use of a condom is not going to be an option, obviously. Um, and the work that, that Dr. Ramji did to, you know, to sort of move that field along is, is really critically important. Uh, 
that there's not a vaginal microbicide available yet in that work still has not come to fruition. But that, that, that really is an important aspect of the whole HIV field that uh, yeah, and, really necessary going forward. And, and just to stay with that, it, you know, and just sort of asking these sort of questions that help ground us a little bit in, in the reality of HIV AIDS in the world today, um, where are the highest infection rates right now? Is it in places like where Dr. Ramji was doing her work? Is it still in Sub-Saharan Africa? And um, I know Russia has a uh, high infection rate. Yeah, Sub-Saharan Africa still has 60%, two thirds of the, of the cases of HIV, um, new cases and existing cases. Um, Russia, sort of the Central Asia, areas there's been increases lately um, and it's important to remember it hasn't gone away in the united states we still have like 40 000 new cases something like that a year of, of hiv um, and it's more and more affecting infecting minority populations we see a, a disproportionate number of cases in the african american community uh, in the united states so it, yeah i mean i think sub-saharan africa eastern central europe are sort of the, the biggest hotbeds worldwide. But I think it's well, for all of us not to, to forget that it, it still is present here, it's still popular here too. Absolutely. So, you know, um, you were speaking earlier about, of course, it's still very early days with COVID-19, but from what you were saying, at least in the United States, that doesn't seem to be yet noticed um, very strong effect of having HIV making someone more likely to get COVID-19. But there's another dimension of that, which is um, just around the kind of public health messaging that has to go on. So I'm curious on the, on the, as we think about this, what has been the effect of number one, the overburdening of the medical system, and number two, the lockdowns that happened in March through May all across the country in terms of reducing access for the kinds of things people need um, to not acquire HIV? Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's another great, great question and a big area of concern in the, in the HIV the Will the lockdowns uh, negatively affect individuals' abilities to get their meds, get some testing, uh, et cetera? Th there's been um, a, a couple kind of interesting stories coming out of, of that. Um, you know, one of the, the UNAIDS and World Health Organization uh, goals lately has been that the 90, 90, 90, so 90% of the people who are infected should know they're infected. 90% um, of the people who know they're infected should be on treatment. 90% of people on treatment should show viral suppression, reduce viral loads of, of HIV. Um, and that first 90%, 90% of the infected people should know they're infected. Um, mm. It's entirely a question of testing. The people should get tested and right. know the results. So one big concern was that there would be a, a decrease in the availability of testing uh, as a result of some of the lockdowns that have, mm -hmm. that have existed. And again, if people aren't tested, they don't know they're infected, they're not gonna get treated. Uh, there's a whole cascade of issues associated with that. Um, you know, several countries in, in Africa tried to address that by setting up um, increased home testing availability. So that there's a, a rapid home test that's available for HIV I know the, the International AIDS uh, Society uh, AIDS Conference virtual meeting this past July, uh, they profiled a program in Eswatini, formerly Swaziland, where they, because traditional testing sites were being shut down as a result of the lockdown, uh, they were setting up mm -hmm. sort of um, almost like a card table outside different places where people could come by, pick up an at-home test, go home and get tested um, and then hopefully get in touch with their healthcare providers you know, if they had a positive result. Yeah, but they, they set up a, a method where hopefully they could get tests out to a large number of people to, to sort of avoid that. Um, so I, I think there's been some interesting mm. attempts to mitigate the, the effects of those, of those lockdowns. I, you know, I, I was thinking just you're talking about the testing and I don't know, if you know this offhand, but how long was it before we had a reliable HIV test in the United States? Uh, there, you know, 
blood test. So the, the virus, the, the first cases of AIDS were reported in the scientific press in 1981. The virus was discovered in 1984. Um, there was a blood test available by 85, I believe, 85, 86. So there's a, a, an antibody-based blood test that was available pretty rapidly. Um, in, in terms of, it, but that was used more by groups like the Red Cross to test the, the safety of the blood for supply blood products, for right. heat transfusions and people with right. hemophilia, right. et cetera. Um, you know, when, when testing became accessible to sort of the general public, it was probably mid 90s, I'd say, early 90s that that became more, more part of the routine care of, of individuals that mm -hmm. began testing. It's, it's remarkable. I think that keeping that history in mind is really important because, you know, in the United States, so much of our discussion about the national response to COVID-19 has hinged on whether or not, well, what happened um, with the testing, first of all, and with the CDC, but then also just the ongoing issues of people having access to those <laughs> tests. And it's been treated, I think, um, and of course, I believe people should have access to them. I mean, that's how you that's how you have the kind of awareness that tells you whether you're doing the right thing or not with the virus. But at the same time, there was sort of a built in idea that it, it should be available immediately. I mean, it, it's quite interesting. I talked with Andy Lakoff about this early on in COVID calls about, you know, the sort of changes in the way we think about diagnostics and how you know, we're just sort of accustomed to the idea that you would have a test for something like this just rapidly like that. Yeah, I mean, the, yes, we're, we're critical of, you know, sort of the rollout of testing and the availability of drugs and you know, even the vaccine. Um, there's all sorts of discussions about, you know, why don't we have a vaccine yet? Uh, but yeah, if you do think of it from a more historical perspective, the, the rapid pace of discoveries, advancements, et cetera, of COVID really is remarkable. I mean, the, the first cases in Wuhan were reported in December, maybe of 2019, yeah. and you know, the virus was discovered. It was sequenced really, really quickly. Um, we have testing available you know, within within months. We have testing available. We have now, I forget how many vaccines are in the pipeline. Now, right. a, a huge number of, of candidate vaccines are are in the pipeline. All within like, nine months of the the first reports of like, what we now know as COVID nineteen. So, so yeah, there, there have been rapid advancements, um, which I, I think does get forgotten sometimes. I just want to remind everyone that you're listening to COVID Calls. We're talking about HIV AIDS today with Dave Westner. Dave, you mentioned uh, vaccines, and I want to, let's talk about that a little bit because um, there was a story in Science Magazine uh, just two days ago, I'm just going to read one line from it and, and get your reaction to this. It said, um, certain COVID-19 vaccine candidates could increase susceptibility to HIV, warns a group of researchers who in 2007 learned that an experimental HIV vaccine had raised in some people the risk for infection with the AIDS virus. These concerns have percolated in the background of the race for a vaccine to stem the coronavirus pandemic, but now the researchers have gone public with a cautionary tale, in part because trials of those candidates may soon begin in locales that have pronounced HIV epidemics, such as South Africa. Can you untangle that story for us a little bit? Because it is a little, it is a little complicated. And as you said, I mean, vaccine for COVID-19 is in the news every day now. Um, but the depth of that reporting is often not great. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about what you know about this story. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting story. So uh, just a, a little background. I think when we typically think of vaccines for viruses, uh, we tend to think of them in, in two different bins. There are inactivated vaccines, killed vaccines, um, or there are live attenuated vaccines. And we, we have a long history with both both kinds of polio vaccine. You know, we have both the Sabin and the Salk. One is an inactivated virus. So the virus is treated so it no longer can replicate. Um, and we have a, the attenuated version of the polio vaccine in which the virus has mutated so it can replicate, but it doesn't cause disease. And traditionally, those have been the two types of vaccines that, we've, uh, that we're most familiar with. Um, 
there are all sorts of other platforms that are being looked at, um, especially with, with COVID-19. Um, so one of the, the, the one related to the story that you brought up there, some of the candidate vaccines are these adenovirus uh, vector vaccines. So the idea is rather than taking SARS-CoV-2, inactivating it, making it attenuated, and injecting it into a person, you take just one or two of the genes of that virus. And most, most groups are using the spike protein. There's one protein on the surface of SARS-CoV-2 uh, that our immune system presumably sees and will attach to. Mm -hmm. You take the gene for that spike protein, and then you insert it into an adenovirus. So adenovirus is a very common virus. Uh, it's sometimes associated with common cold. It's something that you know, most people have been exposed to in their lives. Researchers can take the normal adenovirus, the wild type adenovirus. They can remove certain genes from it to make it uh, unable, non-pathogenic, unable to cause disease. Replace those genes with the gene from something else, mm -hmm. so the SARS and COVID-2 spike protein. And the idea is then you immunize something with that recombinant adenovirus. The virus will replicate but not cause disease. It will also produce the coronavirus spike protein. Our immune system will recognize that as something foreign, produce antibodies to it, and you have a, a, a more typical immune response. So that, that's sort of the idea behind these adenovirus vector vaccines. So the, the story that came out just a, a couple of days ago, there was a HIV vaccine candidate back in the 2008, 2009, I believe. Mm -hmm. That was one of these adenovirus-based vector vaccines. So again, they took adenovirus, took out a chunk of its genome, replaced it with an HIV gene. Um, and when they gave it to people in some subset of the individuals, when those individuals then got uh, exposed to HIV, they were actually more susceptible to HIV infection than individuals who had not received vaccine. Uh, and, and again, the, the um, exact reason I don't think has been well understood um, still, but the, the basic problem was, you know, again, given this adenovirus-based vaccine, um, and then if they do get exposed to HIV, they have a worse outcome, they're more likely to get infected than individuals who are not vaccinated. You know, obviously, that's not a good that's not a good situation. So in, in this article um, in The Lancet, they, they brought that up because some of the COVID vaccines are these adenovirus-based mm -hmm. vaccines. Uh, they raise the possibility that you know, if we're giving this vaccine to individuals who are at risk for HIV, are they now going to have a, a greater I see. chance of contracting HIV than if they had not been vaccinated? I see. What a complicated story. I mean, can you, can, yeah. and I mean, and the, the, on, the ongoing, so where are we then in terms of the search for a vaccine for HIV? I mean, this would be, again, getting to these issues about our expectations about science these days. We've grown so used to, uh, you know, wonder treatments and wonder drugs and extension of life. And as you were talking earlier with the antiretrovirals, the extension of life for people with HIV and yet, of course, still millions and millions of people around the world uh, have it. So the vaccine is obviously still desirable. What's been the, I don't want to say why it's so slow, because that sounds like the wrong way to ask the question, but why don't we have it? Yeah, I think it's, I think looking at the HIV vaccine challenges is important as we think about a COVID-19 vaccine. Um, it's not as simple as you just, you know, take a piece of the virus, inject it in someone, you have a great vaccine, you're good to go. Um, again, HIV was discovered in 83, 84. Margaret Heckler, who was then the Secretary of Health and Human Services, I believe at that point in time, um, she famously, infamously had a press conference and said, we've discovered the virus, we'll probably have a vaccine in a couple of years. And that was back in 1984. And you know, here we are 35 years later, and we're still looking for that, that elusive HIV vaccine. Um, the HIV is not COVID-19. Those are the two very different viruses. Sure. But I think the HIV story points out that developing a vaccine can be tricky. In some cases, you can get a vaccine fairly 
quickly, fairly easily for a new newly discovered virus. Um, in other cases, as we see with HIV, that there's a lot of, of issues along the way. So, you know, the preliminary studies that have come out with the candidate vaccines for SARS-CoV-2 look encouraging. Um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't bet the house on you know, one of those coming through in the next you know, month, two months, three months. Yeah, I think there, there could be unforeseen problems down the road um, that would not be unheard of in the search for a vaccine. Is it that somehow the issue of getting the COVID-19 vaccine doesn't present as quite as difficult of, of a challenge? Or is it something else about political will, funding, I mean, I don't think we've ever had an operation warp speed in the United States for an, a, an HIV vaccine, or if I'm aware, you correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but I think particularly in the 80s, you know, we know HIV AIDS was wrapped up in a culture war against LGBTQ Americans. And mm -hmm. so that we have to take that into account. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I think there's, there's definitely a, a political component to it. I mean, there, there's much more of a um, impetus to develop a COVID-19 vaccine now than there was an HIV vaccine in the, the early 1980s or the early 1990s. Um, I mean, that said, there are biological reasons why HIV has been a tough nut to crack also. Um, it mutates extremely rapidly. Mm -hmm. SARS-CoV-2 seems like it does not mutate that rapidly. Um, just the fact that you know, HIV is affecting our immune system is a, a confounding factor in the development of vaccine. Uh, again, SARS-CoV-2 does not affect the immune system in, in that way. So, so there are certainly mm -hmm. biological reasons mm -hmm. why developing a vaccine for COVID could, should be easier than developing a vaccine for, for HIV. Um, but I think you're absolutely right that there's, we can't discount the importance of the, uh, the political will to get that vaccine developed also. Maybe we can talk a little bit about treatments then, because, um, you know, even as you say, if you're hoping for a COVID-19 vaccine in the next three months, maybe you'll be disappointed. And we have the complicating measure of how it will be rolled out, will, how many doses, you know, and unfortunately, you know, there's anti-vaccination, very strong anti-vaccination feeling among some in the United States. And there's been a for me, kind of unexpected, but countervailing anti-vaccination, uh, I won't call it a movement yet, but a critique that said, well, if Trump is rushing us to a vaccine, I'm going to wait and I'm not going to be vaccinated. And I hear that a lot of, uh, among a lot of people who would not consider themselves anti-vaxxers. What I'm saying is it's going to be very complicated and the vaccine is not going to roll out immediately. So therapies are required. I mean, we need to talk about treatments that are non-vaccination. I wonder what can we learn from from HIV AIDS on that front? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think that the potential problems of the vaccine, you're absolutely right about those. I mean, even if you know, one becomes available in January, I think best, best case scenario, phase three trials look good, a vaccine becomes available or approved for use in, in January. You know, then the question is, how do you get it rolled out? I mean, how do you get millions of people vaccinated? Um, and having a vaccine approved, you know, it, it could be approved when it's only 60-70% effective. You know, in other mm -hmm. words, you get vaccinated, you know, there's you're 60-70% less likely to get infected if you get exposed. It's not a hundred percent guarantee. Um, and on top of that, you have a number of people for a variety of reasons who don't want to get vaccinated. Um, you know, even if we have millions of doses that are available to everybody, that doesn't mean this is all going away anytime anytime soon. So, so I think you're right. I mean, therapeutics is another issue that, that has to be addressed. Um, yeah, again, there's, there's a lot that are in the pipeline. Um, mm. Yeah. As you know, from stories that have come out, you know, a lot of the ones that received hype in the popular press have sort of fallen by the, the wayside. I mean, hydroxychloroquine right. talked about by the president a lot. There's no evidence that it is improving the, the, course of COVID-19 in sure. individuals who are infected. Um, remdesivir also has been talked about a lot. It's, it's um, another antiviral. Um, again, the latest data on that is that it's probably not particularly effective in individuals mm -hmm. with, with um, SARS-CoV-2 infections. 
So uh, I think that's another, you know, we're hearing a lot more about vaccines. And again, long-term, yes, a great vaccine is going to be absolutely essential to controlling the pandemic. Uh, until that comes, I, we could really benefit from better therapeutics and, and those just, those aren't there just yet. It's, it's I've, I've spoken with so many really brilliant people who study public health and epidemiology and the history of public health. And one of the things I've learned a lot talking to them is about the principles of harm reduction. And the idea that, you know, public health officials may want population to behave in a certain way, but at some point you have to deal with the reality of how people are behaving and try to reduce the harm within that. And I think that's probably been, as I understand it, very essential um, to fighting HIV. And, you know, it comes back to our earlier question about that problem in the lockdown phase of having people getting access to information, to um, contraception, to prep, things like that. I, I wonder, again, I mean, just sort of thinking by analogy, how you see um, the harm reduction issue with COVID-19. And I guess here I'm talking about masks. I'm talking about, you know, social distance and things like that. What do you, what lesson do you take from the struggle for harm reduction principles with HIV and apply that to COVID-19? Can we learn from that lesson? Yeah, I mean, uh, hopefully there are lessons that, that can be learned. Uh, again, if you're talking about harm reduction with HIV, it's a very different thing than harm reduction for, for COVID-19 sure. just because of you know, how the viruses are transmitted. Um, yeah, but there, yeah, I, I often talk to my students, you know, students are 18, 19, 20 years old. I mean, you know, when they were born, sort of the universal precautions that we all take for granted when you're dealing with blood, you know, those didn't, ex those had existed their entire life. They, they didn't exist for our entire lives, your and my entire lives. Right. Uh, so I often talk to students about, you know, it wasn't always the case where, you know, if you're in basketball game, someone gets cut and take their jersey off and put a new jersey on. It wasn't always the case where you went to the dentist and the dentist always had gloves on to prevent the transmission of, of something. You know, there, there's things that we do as sort of a matter of course now that didn't exist 30 years ago and exist now because of mm -hmm. HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. and, and I, you know, I wonder what what's going to become normal now as a result mm -hmm. of COVID-19 that we didn't consider normal you know, nine months ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in Asian countries, wearing masks is, is much more common, has sure. been much more common than it has been here for a long time. You know, maybe that becomes more of a standard, especially during you know, the winter months when you're indoors, or maybe when you're in you know, crowded situations. Um, so, yeah, I think it's interesting to, to consider what, what might be the long-term um, changes that we see as a result of uh, COVID-19. You know, for harm reduction with, with HIV, you know, there's, again, very different situation, but you know, you know, we see a lot of you know, making condoms available, um, having safe injection sites for right. people who inject drugs to prevent right. the preventing the likelihood of an overdose for one, but also prevent, preventing the transmission of, of HIV. Um, another topic that I, I think is, is interesting is sort of the question of legalizing sex work. You know, if you have sex work legalized and regulated, does that make it safer for the, the individuals who are selling sex? Does it make it safer for individuals who are buying sex? Right. Uh, I think there are a lot of, of really interesting topics about harm reduction that have been percolating for a while. Uh, within the HIV field um, and continue to, to percolate within that field. It's, it, to me, it's interesting, I mean, the two you just mentioned, I mean, there's still, even though there's plenty of good science that would indicate what kind of policy steps should be taken, that's not sufficient. I mean, you, you tap into sort of deeper cultural mores and values in a society that we're still arguing about, for example, injection sites. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and I guess some cities have, have taken that at the municipal level, um, but as a, as a national strategy, that hasn't been there. And I'm, I'm like you, I'm curious, you know, which kind of things might stick um, going, going out of COVID-19? Will we find it normal to wear a mask, you know, two or three, four years from now? I live in New Jersey. I would say the answer is yes, but 
I have family that lives in Texas, and I'll tell you the answer there would be no. Right, yeah. yeah that, that's the other, um, from a public health perspective, one of the, the frustrating things about this, this pandemic. I mean, you look at some other countries um, that have fared better than the United States, and quite honestly, most countries have fared better than the, than the United States. That's true. Um, but you know, if you had a more, if you had a bigger buy-in from the general population for these these basic things, wearing a mask, social distancing, etc., um, you know, that seems to mean you have a better outcome for the population as a whole within within the country. You know, but in the United States, you know, we haven't had a national response to this, and and local responses have been very different. They, they've you know, varied tremendously from, from place to place. Um, and I, I think that's been a large part of the problem. We don't, we haven't had, uh, early on, we didn't have a consistent response. Uh, and as a result, the, the infection rate kept percolating through different areas, spiking and, and, and going down at different points in time. Isn't that a lesson that we sh should have, I, I keep using this phrase, lessons learned, which has its own kind of problems, but I, it's so, manifest to me it seems like that that story you just told could it's also the story of hiv aids in america in the 1980s isn't it i mean it wasn't it treated very much as a as a, a really sort of an issue within individual cities and and states in the absence of a really coherent federal policy uh, absolutely yeah that, that's absolutely the case and, and that contributed to the um, the rise in cases of hiv aids that that we saw throughout the the 80s and 90s yes that's I, I think that's worth underlining it and a sort of missed opportunity maybe to draw something from that um and i guess you know people have pointed out to me too that sort of federal preparedness for epidemic pandemic is it's not linear there are times when we're more prepared and times when we're less well prepared have you been surprised by the federal response to COVID 19 yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, I, I would have liked to see a stronger response early on. Um, yeah, I think it placed me near New Jersey, in New York. You know, New York got hit really, really hard early on, obviously, and and had a really strong response and, and got things pretty much under control. I mean, I, I think the you know, the rate now in in New York City surrounding areas is. I think it's going up again, but it, it's fairly it low for, for quite a while. Yeah. Um, those kinds of responses work, but again, we, we we didn't see that on a national level. We didn't see that even on a regional level. And I, you know, I can I can sort of understand it initially. You know, we didn't see any cases or, or very very few cases in North Carolina until like maybe mid April. You know, mm. I can sort of see people here saying, "Why should I do anything?" Right. This is not. I don't know anyone who has COVID nineteen. That there's you know, no surge of the hospitals. The hospitals are still open. Everything. I can see people saying it. It's not a problem. Why should I do anything? Yeah. But then we saw by you know, middle of May, cases start going up. Middle of June, they're they're even higher, um, and that that sense of being separate from the problem you know, quickly disappeared after after a while. You know, if you had had a more unified response yeah. early on, potentially you could have prevented a lot of those surges that we saw, those secondary surges that we saw uh, in the South, now in the in the Midwest and other locations. Yeah, there's a really eerie symmetry there with what you've just been describing with the story of the history of HIV AIDS in, in mm -hmm. the United States, which was thought to be a sort of a Philadelphia and New York and San Francisco and Miami problem. And then uh, within a relatively short period of time, it was a, a rural American problem. It's an American problem. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and early on with HIV, it was primarily in the, in the gay population, men on sex with men. Um, and, and again, I think people were you know, sort of had their head in the sand and thought this is only right. a gay problem. Um, right. Yeah. And now we see increasing numbers in, in women, women of color, especially. Uh, you know, it's, you know, we knew biologically it wasn't just a gay problem. Um, but getting that message out to the to the public and get the public to act on something that the public didn't see as a concern of theirs. Um, yes, it was absolutely a missed opportunity then, and we've seen similar missed opportunities now. 
I want to remind everyone you're listening to COVID Calls, and today we're talking about HIV AIDS and COVID-19 with Dave Wessner. Dave, one of the articles you wrote, which I learned a lot from, um, you published in Forbes in July. The headline was How Infectious Diseases Like COVID-19 Get Their Names and Why It's Important to Use Them Correctly. I'm just going to read a line from it and, and get you to tell us a little bit more about this. The viruses have official names, SARS-CoV-2 and HIV. The associated diseases also have official names, COVID-19 and AIDS. For both pandemics, these names arose via a deliberate process involving input from an international array of researchers and clinicians. One could reasonably ask if this naming process matters. After all, when the world is in the midst of a pandemic, taking time to officially name a disease may seem unnecessary, but names matter words matter. I found this fascinating and illuminating. Could you tell us more about this? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think, um, yeah, I think it's an interesting topic just from sort of a academic perspective. Why do we call some disease, whatever we we call it? Um, but as I said in our blog, I mean, I think those names really do matter. I mean, for the, for the biologist, for the clinician, for the, the medical worker, the, it, it's helpful if the name reflects something about the virus or something about the, the disease. So you know, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, AIDS, I mean, it tells you what it is. You acquire it, it's not genetic. There's an immunodeficiency associated with it. So it, it's a descriptive name you know, rather than some name that's, that's not really uh, biologically relevant. Um, that's one part of the issue. I mean, I think a bigger part of the issue is how do we as, as people talk to each other about these viruses, about these diseases? How do we as, as people think about people with these diseases, people at risk for, for these diseases? Um, and you certainly know the early years of, of HIV, there, there are all sorts of derogatory terms that were yeah. used by all sorts of people, the gay plague, gay cancer, um, et cetera. And, and we see that, unfortunately, we've seen that again with COVID-19, uh, there we have the president continued calling calling it the Chinese virus, um, and, and worse epithets than than that. I mean, those kinds of names aren't helping the dialogue at all, for one, um, and and they're they're hurting the dialogue. I mean, they're they're stigmatizing specific groups of people. They're in some ways pitting one group of people against another group uh, of people, um, and I think those you know, that sort of cavalier use of language, I would, I would say, is, is really detrimental to the, the public health messages we're trying to get out, detrimental to you know, us just sort of acting civilly with, with one another as, as fellow human right. beings. And just to follow up on that, it, it's, you know, the, when you say gay plague, and I, and I think of President Trump talking about the China plague, you know, I mean, it's it's it strikes me. It's one thing if people just don't know how to call a phenomena yet, and it's sort of an absence of scientific understanding, or just an absence of knowing what to call something. Um, it's quite something else when people intentionally misuse a name to leverage it for political benefit, and I guess. You know, I guess to to put this in a broader context, we are living in a time where um, science has been under attack, and not in some sort of obscure way, but like at the lectern from the president of the United States with Anthony Fauci standing right next to him. I mean, I just to bring you back to this this issue around the name. I mean, we literally have situations where the president calls it one thing and then he gives the lectern to Dr. Burks or to Dr. Fauci and they call it by the correct name. It's so striking to me that that battle being, you know, waged literally in real time in front of news cameras. Have you ever seen anything like that? No, I don't think I ever have seen anything like that. Um, yeah, I, I often wonder during those press conferences, uh, yeah, I understand Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks are, yeah, I think they're, they're there because they, they're trying to make, you know, have the right decisions be made ultimately, um, but how they they don't visibly react to to some of the comments being made 
from from their boss, I, I think is is remarkable. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, using the names like that, getting back to the names like that, it, again, it's I can certainly understand people who, who don't don't know the scientific terms. You know, they're they're just using some sort of colloquial term because they don't know any more formal term for a disease for a virus. Um, but if it's being used intentionally as it as it has been, I mean that's that's serving no purpose other than to hit one group of people against another, to marginalize one group of people, um, to increase stigmatization against different groups of people. And and further, I mean, I guess sort of coming back to the period you're talking about with HIV AIDS in the 80s, it I wonder, you know, the potential it has to actually slow down the the broader formation of a political will to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. Because if COVID-19 um, is connected with China, I mean, first of all, that we know that that led in April and May of the United States to attacks on Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. But also, it might have the tendency um, to repel dollars that should be going into that area if it's sort of somehow associated with not an American problem. I worry about that because that was obviously back to what we were talking about before for AIDS research in the 80s and 90s. So long as it was associated with um, a disease of gay men, then it couldn't build that broader political base, could it? Yeah, you're absolutely you're absolutely right. With HIV, that's definitely the case. I mean, there's stories of um, President Reagan not using the word AIDS until 1986 or something, whatever the, the date was. Um, there's all sorts of stories about you know, grants not being able to have the word homosexual in them because they weren't going to get funded if they if they had the word homosexual in some place in the in the narrative. Um, so yeah, I, I think that. Stigmatization, stigmatization there definitely slowed the progress of, of science. And I think you're right. I think it, it has the potential um, continuing to, to slow the, the progress of science. I mean, I think with COVID-19, it's a little bit, or COVID it's a little bit different situation because it's very obvious now that we're all at risk. You know, anyone can get infected. Um, but still by, by framing it as you know, this came from over there, you know, they made this virus, they sent this virus here. Um, I think it does put a, a very dangerous spin on, on the science that, that can and should be done. I wonder, you know, you're training young scientists. Is, is this the kind of thing that um, young people going into science, do you think they're, they know that they're also going into politics at the same time? I mean, a lot of times we've treated science and politics as if they're separate in America, but of course, American history shows science and politics inseparable at many different points, maybe not as ostentatiously as they have been the last few months, but what do the young people that you're educating uh, say about those those conflicts? Yeah, it, it's one issue that I, I try to raise in the courses that I'm, I'm teaching, whether it's an intro course or a more upper level microbiology course. Um, yeah, I, I try to raise these issues of, of social justice, of health disparities. Um, one of the, I, my students in my microbiology class the last couple of years read this um, memoir by Peter Piot. Peter Piot was a researcher early in the Ebola days in the mid-1970s and then in the HIV days in the mid-1980s. But I, I think his, his memoir is interesting because it, it points out a lot of, of those kinds of, of issues. You know, what does it mean for American European scientists to go into Africa and try to fix a problem in the case of Ebola especially? Um, in Africa, um, it, it wasn't mean not to have representation in the sciences, to have mostly white men driving the show. Um, right. So I, I try to bring those up, those issues up with my students because I, you know, I often say in, in, in class, you know, science doesn't exist in a vacuum. You can't, I don't think you shouldn't, you can't sort of totally remove science as being this dispassionate analytical look without considering the, the political, the social, the cultural aspects of, of whatever it is that you're studying as well. Well, I, I guess if students had thought something like that was possible before January, they now know that's, <laughs> that's not true. And I mean, just to come back to, you know, we mentioned Dr. Fauci. I mean, he's one who's also, his career has spanned both sides of this, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he was, um, I mean, maybe you want to say a little bit about your thinking about it, it, 
you know, there's, there's a generation of scientists who were coming up into that work exactly at that moment. Their careers, early careers were defined by HIV AIDS work and now they're in leadership positions. And that this is defining their career in the later stage. Yeah, I mean, um, Dr. Fauci and, and Burks too. I mean, Debbie Burks worked for Tony Fauci at the NIH in the mid eighties uh, doing some of the very basic HIV work. So yeah, both of them came up through the HIV epidemic um, and um, Robert Redfield had the CDC also began his career really with the, the HIV field in the, in the 1980s. So a lot of the individuals, um, of course, sort of yeah, driving the response now, driving the show now, uh, really cut their teeth with that prior epidemic, the HIV AIDS epidemic. I, I, I've wondered if that didn't somehow prepare them in ways they didn't realize they were quite prepared. I mean, those were really pitched political battles in the 1980s. I mean, ACT UP brought demonstrations literally right to the doors of the NIH, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I saw a recent, I, I don't have the link for it handy, but I saw an interesting interview recently, um, uh, released recently between Larry Kramer and um, Anthony Fauci. Oh. In, in the 1980s, I mean, they, they were at each other's throats. Absolutely. Uh, the activist Larry Kramer complaining about almost everything that the NIH and, and Tony Fauci were, were doing. Um, and this interview, which was relatively recently, the last few years, I guess, um, I mean, it was, it was really touching because Larry Kramer said, you know, I, I really respected everything you were, you were doing. I felt that things had to get pushed faster, harder. Sure. You know, we couldn't just let you guys sit back and do your thing. Um, but I always respected what you were doing from, from your position. And it was really a, an interesting interview to hear them reflecting on the sort of our, what we were doing 40 years ago now, 35 years ago now, mm -hmm. uh, and, and what they were, how they both saw that looking back with the, through the lens of history. There was one more, we're just up on, up on time, but there's one more dimension of this I wanted to ask you about, and it's actually, it's, it connects with what you were just talking about, um, which is uh, about memorial and about how we do process that past. And that was also a process for HIV AIDS, right? I mean, it was, it was too long for Americans to acknowledge it. It was too long to acknowledge the humanity of the sufferers and too long I mean, HIV, AIDS, um, family members and survivors didn't wait around for America to build a memorial on the on the mall. They started the AIDS quilt and, um, you know, that project that Cleve Jones started and, and many others to me is one of the most extraordinary memorial projects that the world has seen. Mm -hmm. I guess my question, I'd like to know sort of what you think about it and, and then also what we might pull from the desire to give value to that suffering, to remember those lives, what we can pull from that as we're dealing with this very dark time that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the AIDS quilt, I think, is a remarkable uh, piece of, of folk art, I guess is what it would be, be called. Um, and you asked earlier about some of my you know, formative experiences becoming a, a scientist, becoming a biologist. And I think the AIDS quilt fits very strongly into that, into mm. that story. Um, the, the AIDS quilt was last displayed in, in its entirety in 1996, I believe it was, on the grounds of the, the Washington Monument, the Washington Mall uh, mm -hmm. in D.C. And if you're familiar with the Washington uh, Monument, Washington Mall, the panels, I mean, there was something like 30,000 panels at that yeah. point in time, and it just covered the, the mall. Um, I was living in Washington at the, at the time doing doing research at the... Oh, is that right? Okay. Center, and went down to see that. And you know, walking through those those panels um I mean, panel after panel after panel almost every of that one of them was you know, a young guy you know very similar to myself you know, born 1960 died 1990 whatever whatever it may be and the number of the panels that had some mention on them about you know this person died alone because his family disowned him or this person died homeless because the landlord kicked them out um, and that was really, really a moving experience for me. I mean, I'd been interested in the science of HIV, and but I'd been looking at it, looking at it as a scientist, um, and and really seeing that viscerally. I mean, there's there's a lived experience associated with this that that we can't we can't 
we can't discount that lived experience. I mean, that, that's as much a part of HIV AIDS as all the scientific advancements that we've, that we've had. Uh, and, and I think seeing that really, you know, it was a couple years later that I came to Davidson and began teaching. I think that really affected the way I teach science. I mean, I've always felt the need to teach those cultural, social um, issues associated with, with science. And I think a lot of it's because of seeing that that quilt and and really seeing how the science has been done uh, again there was a lived experience associated with that with that yeah. science. and and yet in jumping forward to, to COVID-19 yeah, I, I hope there is a similar memorial in some way to those that we've lost to this I mean they um, yeah again I going back to your beginning I, I really appreciate you reading um, a story like that at the beginning of each one of your episodes to just show everyone that you know there are lived experiences associated with this. These are these are real people, you know, a quarter of a million real people in the United States, um, a million people, real people worldwide. Um, and we can't just have them be numbers. We can't just have them be data points on a right. graph someplace. I think we have to, you know, we as a people, we as a society have to find a way to memorialize them um, in some fashion. I couldn't agree more. And thank you for sharing that that experience of seeing the quilt, that's something I would really like to see. I, there's a point in what you made there that I really want to underline too, which is the loneliness aspect. And in a lot of the obituaries I read of COVID sufferers and those who've died, um, or those who've survived, but went through weeks of isolation, um, the idea that they were gonna to have to say goodbye or that they did say goodbye to their families, um, if they have a chance to remotely, Mm -hmm. without touch um, all the way through burial and all the way through the memorial services, which people can't even come to those. Um, there's a kind of shocking resonance there also with the HIV AIDS story that you were you know, describing what you're seeing with the quilts. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, I want to remind everybody you've been listening to COVID Calls Tremendous conversation, learned a lot. Thank you so much, Dave Westner, for your time today and for the research and the writing that you're doing right now. And please keep it up. Um, and I hope we'll, we'll keep in touch. And uh, if you can catch COVID calls every weekday, 5 p.m. Eastern time. Tomorrow we're gonna to be talking about um, the experience of living through the pandemic for high school students. And so we're gonna have several high school students on tomorrow and have a really great conversation. And um, this will be a big draw. Shivani Patel is going to come back as my co-host uh, tomorrow. So please do join me for that at five o'clock. And uh, Dave Westner, thanks again. Well, thanks for having me, Scott. I really appreciate it. Stay healthy, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow at five o'clock.